Hello, everybody. This is a problem titled Analysis of a Compound Indeterminate Coaxial Core and Shell Member. What a mouthful, right? All right, in this member, adjust that over a little bit. Um, in this member, we see uh, planes A, B, and C. And we see that the, the member has been uh, created by taking a shell element. Think of that as a hollow cylinder that's 1.2 meters long. And a core element, like a continuous solid cylinder, that runs this entire length. So if we sum up 1.2 and 1.7, we'll get a length of 2.9 meters uh, for that element. Okay, so think of this as a solid cylinder between A and C that has a shell sleeve over it between A and B, and that we have, you know, bonded these two materials together, maybe with a high strength epoxy or glue. And as a result, we will assume that these materials are acting compositely. Um, as I run through the problem statement at the left, I want to give credit. I adapted this from a problem uh, created by Dr. Timothy Philpot in his amazing McMovies work. Um, and so I adapted this from one of his problems on his website. All right, we're going to put a force of 70 kilon kilonewtons into the problem over here. And we're going to neglect buckling. So later in this course, we will talk about the tendency of slender columns to buckle. We're just going to neglect that limit state for now and just you know say that we're going to check everything except for buckling uh, with this problem. All right. Uh, what I am going to do, let me make sure I've got the right layer here. All right, so I know that I've got the dimensions on the drawing, so all the stuff I got. The moduli of elasticity for these two materials is given. So the shell has a modulus of elasticity of 200 gigapascals. And the core has a modulus of elasticity of 80 gigapascals. So I'm going to add all that over there. Um, we want to do a normal force diagram. We want to solve for the maximum stress in the shell and in the core. And then we want to determine the translation of the plane containing C. So where does that end move after we apply this force? OK, and what I'm going to do to give myself a little bit of space to work this problem is I'm going to turn off that problem statement. We can bring it back if we need it and work on a new uh, layer here. OK, what is our approach here? Well, our approach for just about any problem starts the same. So we want to do a free body diagram of our structure. I'm going to free the body from the support at A. and paste that free body over to the left. Now, after I free the body from the support, now I can show two unknowns, two unknowns. Over here at the support, I'm going to have a normal force in the core and a normal force in the shell. Before I get too far along, I want to draw, before I get too far along in the problem, I want to construct an axial force or a normal force dia uh, diagram. 
I'm getting an error message with my microphone. So if you lost me for a minute, I'm back and badder than ever. Um, all right, so what I'm doing is a diagram of internal normal force. So we could call this in for normal force. And we know that in above the line, right, this is where we plot any type of internal tensile forces. Below the line, this is where we plot internal compressive forces. And we have enough information here um, to construct this with you know the limited information that we have so i'm going to do this i'm going to pick um, the pink color and i know that that compressive force of 70 kilonewtons i know that that's got to be constant total amount of force because this is a determinant structure right all 100 percent of that force has to make it to the support at A. So I know that's constant across. But what I don't know is once I get over here, I don't know how much of this 70 Newton might be traveling through the core and how much might be traveling through the shell. But I do know that N sub C plus N sub S has got to equal 70 kilonewton that I can use for this problem. Since I'm one degree indeterminate, I'm ready to write my deformation compatibility equation. I'm going to set this one up to only go between A and B. So I'm going to say between A and B, the deformation in the core is equal to the deformation. I had to pause. I'm having microphone weird error messages. Hopefully I'm back and you can hear me okay. My next step is to take the axial deformation delta, expand it using our equation for axial deformation in L over AE, and I'm ready to plug into this relationship. So my normal force in the core, and of course all of this is pertain, pertaining to the section of this coaxial member that's between A and B only. So I'm not looking at this part of the problem yet. So I could do N sub C, L sub C over A sub C and E sub C equals N sub S, L sub S, A sub S and E sub S. Um, before we start plugging numbers into that expression, do you see anything that can be canceled out and neglected at this point? And hopefully you see that both the core and the shell are the same length. So we can cancel those out. I'm going to rearrange this, move this up just a little bit, and say that my normal force in the core is equal to, and just rearrange this equation like so. At this point, I'm ready to plug in values. And my area of the core that's given to me is 850 millimeters squared. My modulus of the core that is given is 80. In the denominator, my area of the shell that's given is 490. 
millimeters squared and that material property, the modulus of elasticity of the shell element, that's 200 gigapascals. So I'm going to convert that into kilonewtons per millimeter squared. That is how we define a gigapascal. And actually, I just realized this unit is not correct. I'm going to redo these because they will cancel out. I apologize. Yeah, so both of these are gigapascals. So there's no need to change them because we're just going to cancel them out. All right, so now our units are looking good. We're going to look at the ratio between um, N sub C, the normal force in the core, N sub S, that normal compressive force in the shell. And you can punch this one through your calculator. And that yields N sub C equals 0 0.6939 N sub S. And sometimes it's useful to exp express this um, as that inverse as well. So you could also write 1.441 in sub C just by taking the inverse of that 0.6939. OK, now that we have this relationship set up, we're done with our deformation compatibility equation. And so now we just plug into our equation of equilibrium, our statics equation. That was the sum of forces in the x direction equals 0. And I'm going to write this way. So I'm going to put 1.441 in sub c. That's plugging in for n sub s plus n sub c is equal to 70 kilonewtons. Okay, um, add those terms up on the left, you'll get 2.441 in sub c, divide both sides by that number, and you will find that the normal force in the core is equal to 28.67 kilonewtons. That's accurate to four sig figs. course we can just use um, substitution in order to finish off the solution of this system of two equations. Um, so now I'm going to take this value and plug this one back in here and in sub s normal force in the shell is equal to 1.441 times the 28.67 kilonewtons that we just solved for and we get 41.32 kilonewtons of force and these are compressive forces right so I think it's probably best to show the little c in parentheses there to show that yeah those are definitely compressive forces and so you can box these two as some of your um, intermediate answers on this problem. All right, we've got our forces figured out. And at this point, I'm going to pop another layer on here real quick. And we have enough information to refine that diagram. Let's turn down the volume there, go over here. So let's redo our normal force diagram. We know that over on the right segment of the beam, that's still equal to 70 kilonewtons. But now we see that the normal force in the shell element is a little bit bigger than that in the core. So I'm going to draw, I'll draw, I'll maybe exaggerate this a little bit more. And so we'll say that. N sub s is equal to 41.32 kilonewtons. N sub c is equal to 
28.67 kilonewtons. Finish off this plot of our normal forces. And I think we're done with that layer. Okay, let's get one other line here. Come back up just a little bit. And I do want to keep my free body. All right, so we've got the free body back on the screen. And um, maybe just one little reminder here. Let me zoom in just a little bit. One little reminder here about what it is that we are plotting. So here's my zero line. This is my internal tension force. This is my internal compression force. And each one of these locations from left to right, that's telling me what's happening at each one of these cuts from left to right on the free body diagram. So these two drawing, uh, these two types of diagrams are typically drawn so that they line up, as you can see here. All right, we are ready to answer some of the questions that have been posed to us. So if you remember, we were asked first to do the normal force diagram, and we just finished that up. Uh, part B, we want to do the maximum stress in the shell and the core. And then part C, we need to do the deformation and translation piece of, piece of it. Okay, so let us commence that. Let's do our maximum stresses. Okay. My shell is only present between A and B, and I've got a force of 41.32, and I've got my area there. So I can just do stress equals force over area. My in sub shell 41.32, and watch what I'm going to do with the units. I'm going to proactively throw in E3 newtons because I know that stresses are generally expressed as megapascals. My area of the shell, that's 490 millimeters squared. And this part right here is going to give us an answer in megapascals. We know that our result is going to be in compression. And that number to three sig figs will be 84.3. Now that we've got our max stress in the shell done, now we can do the core. And the core goes all the way between A and C. So where's my worst case internal force? Is it over here, this 28 and change? Nope, it's the full 70, right? Because this is also the normal force in the core between planes B and C. Subscripts are getting kind of funny, so I'm just going to remove that one completely. All right, let's run the calculation. Stress equals N over A. Now I want my 70 E3 newtons divided by 850 millimeters squared. Again, we'll have those megapascals. It will be a compressive stress because it's a compressive force. And as we divide that through, we'll get 82.4 megapascals, just like that. Right, that's the answer to part B. We figured out our worst case stresses in the system. And now we need to do our translation problem. Give myself another layer for this one and hack at it some more. So what we want to do is solve the translation 
of the plane that contains C. So where does this thing move? Now, what does your intuition tell you? Is it going to the left or the right? And boy, I hope you tell me it's going to the left. The reason why is because we do have compression for the entire length. That means we have net shortening, no elongation. And our boundary condition, our fixed support says that A can't move. Therefore, C must translate to the left. We also know that the deformation between A and C is equal to the cumulative change between A and B and between B and C. The way I'm going to set this up is as follows. I'm going to say by inspection, plane C moves in the negative x direction or to the left. And so I am going to recognize that the value of that translation is equal to the value of these two deformations. So I'm going to throw in some absolute value signs. And I'm also going to expand these as follows. I want to use that deformation equation, right? NL over AE. It's an important one. I want to use that again. And for the segment between A and B, I know that the core and shell stay bonded. So however much they change in length, however much they shorten, they're doing that as a team. So I can pick either the core or the shell. Either one is OK. I'm going to pick the shell. Okay, so I'm going to pick the force in the shell, N sub S, the length, and here I'll just say between A and B, the area of the shell, the modulus of the shell, plus the deformation that I'm getting between B and C. So this one's a little more straightforward. I'll do the normal force in the core. Um, I'm worried with the subscripts and I'm going to confuse you, but what I'm referring to is 70 and not 28.67. I'll just leave it like that. Normal force in the core times the length between B and C in the denominator. I want my area of the core, my modulus of the core like that. Okay, after this, we just plug values in. So that's 41.3. Two, and I'm going to leave that as kilonewtons here because I know that I've got these gigapascals lurking in my denominator to deal with here and here in just a minute. My length, I'm going to change that 1.2 E3 millimeters. Thinking head ahead about congruent units, going to change that one to millimeters from meters. In the denominator AS, that's 490 millimeters squared. ES, that's 200 gigapascals. Okay, and this is what I was trying to do earlier. I'll throw the kilonewtons down there in the denominator, put the millimeters squared, flip that up. Pause, check your units like you always, always, always do. And we see that everything cancels out except the millimeters, which is good because we're computing um, deformations in order to get a translation. So delta for deformation, u for translation, two related but different concepts. OK, so we're all set there. And now we do the other term plus open absolute value in the numerator. Now we want all 70 kilonewtons. We need a length of 1.7 E3 millimeters. In the denominator, I need, ooh, need more paper for one thing. I got a little more paper. Uh, so in the denominator, we're going to put area of the core, that's the 850 
millimeters squared, the modulus of the core, that is the 80 gigapascals, a gigapascal is a kilonewton per millimeter squared, end absolute value, spot check units again, that one's gone, that one's gone, that one's gone, that one's gone, that leaves us units of length in which we're happy, add all of these numbers up, and you should get 2.26 millimeters to the left as your final answer to this problem. So kind of cool problem props out to uh, Dr. Timothy Philpot who uh, initiated this and I've kind of adapted and edited for my needs but pretty cool coaxial problem that I hope has helped you really cement some good concepts about stress and deformation for these indeterminate axial structures. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.